You're listening to Shoe In, covering the ins and outs of all things footwear, from sneakers to heels, loafers to slippers, and every type of shoe in between. Brought to you by the FDRA, the footwear industry's association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion. Helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. And now your footwear insiders, Matt Priest and Andy Polk. All right, folks, we continue to discuss the major pain points of the footwear industry, which is supply chains. Chains of supply and the chinks that we keep seeing in the armor that keep occurring in different parts of it. You know, when COVID hit, Matt, we were, you know, first started talking about, you know, COVID hitting and factory shutdowns. So that was one part. And then it became a whole other issue where it started spreading across the country and the globe and, and it started to shut down other aspects, warehouses, trucks, trucks, ports, all these different things. And so uh, as we continue to open, this is the, the last kind of opening the vault of our shoe supply chain summit. Again, because these issues are so important to our industry, we wanted to open this up and let everybody hear these things. So this is the second uh, edition of the panel that Matt ran during the Shoe Supply Chain Summit. Uh, Matt, again, just remind people who who they're about to listen to as we as we hit the second session or the second uh, part of the panel discussion. Yeah, man. So we have Mary McNally from Crocs, Peter Hohensee from Rack Room Shoes, Jung Yoon from Michael Kors, and Mike Pisa from Apex Global Logistics. And Andy, I asked them. How long is this going to last? Is this a short-term thing or is this long-term? And each of these professionals are pretty um, resigned to the fact that it'll be at least a year before we start to see some normalcy within the the footwear supply chain. And so, Blake, uh, roll the tape. Well, Well, some of that, and let me kind of pivot away from the questions real quick. Will some of that, the new entrance into the marketplace, on the, these vessels that you, that you speak of, will that maybe create, maybe not in the short term, but in the long term, some pressure release valves and the cost structure? So one of the challenges that we have is that our members, the industry is saying, hey, look, we're getting raked over the coals. There's like three ocean carriers. They, it's a conspiracy. We're getting crushed. I'm not, I'm not quoting, I'm not putting words in anyone's mouth. I'm just generalizing what we're hearing. Can you do something about it? Can the federal government do something about it? Can President Biden do something about it? Right. But then when you go to the Federal Maritime Commission and you say to them, hey, you're crushing, you're killing us. You send a letter to the president saying we're getting crushed. They come back and say, well, have you filed an official complaint so we can do an investigation? So the companies are like, I don't really want to do that because that'll be public. And then I'll guess what? I'll get raked even further over the coals. Um, and it just is not a healthy business environment. So I hate, I'm a marketplace guy. I hear you. Like, great, the market's driving us up to $17,000 per container, which sounds ridiculous. Now, if that, even in and of itself, if that was it, then, okay, we'd all go home and figure this out. But there's just something that seems awry right now. And I can't put my finger on it, but it just doesn't seem like there's a lot of competition in the, in the marketplace. So, well, long-winded question, but will some of this actually start to help deflate some of this pricing if there's more competition within the marketplace, not just the three ocean carriers. Right. You know, it, it's a it's something that I think probably has to be addressed here long term. But you know, if I, I'm looking at it, the reason the reason these uh, charter vessels are coming to the market, they're looking at an opportunistic business opportunity. They're in it to make money too. I mean, it's not cheap. I mean, we, we had a probably have a lot of cash just to get on these vessels with you know you know. So, so it's not. You know, I think it's more of a business opportunistic. Um, you know, view for them, but the, you know, the issue that you're talking about is really macro. And I think there's a, you know, it's very complex. Like even I started talking about the rail, but if you look at the ports too, right, just like New York and Seattle, Tacoma, San Francisco, Oakland, I mean, we, we're not operating that efficiently uh, and it's causing, it, it's kind of uh, making the situation worse, if you will, when you, you can't get your container off the terminal for 10 or 15 days, right? Everybody on the call wants their cargo as soon as possible, right? So, you know, all these things, I think, you know, government intervention might not be a bad thing, you know, but but can you control what I'll call the private sector? I mean, you know, there's a lot of discussion that, listen, we have no real U.S. flag carriers anymore. So we're kind of relying on foreign, you know, things to uh, foreign entities to kind of drive the U.S. economy. And, you know, the, all those issues are a little bit over my pay grade, Matt. So maybe you can uh, step in and take care of that for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. 
All right. Well, let, Mary, let's let's pivot over to inflation because um, that's a lot of this is a lot of this talk is driving inflation. It continues to be a challenge for the American economy. Um, the U.S. government has said it might be transitory, and now they're saying maybe not. Maybe it's even further out than we thought. Um, increased supply chain costs are certainly a large part of the inflationary environment that we find ourselves in. Are it are there any mitigation strategies uh, that you are deploying right now? to try and keep costs lower on the supply chain side. Yeah, I think all of us have spent quality time with our CFOs and our C- our finance teams um, to certainly last, you know, 16 months, but even year to date. And um, so some of the things that I have, have leveraged and we'll let the team build on this from the call, but I think you said it to begin with, educating stakeholders is like baseline. That's number one, you have to make sure key stakeholders at all levels within your company and your customers are on the same page of what's happening in the market because it's the only way we're going to navigate to this together and think pragmatically at risk Um, because I do think it is a a risk management scenario that we're living in and and the outlook of at least 12 more months means we've got another year ahead of us to be able to to work through this and every day something changes It, it really is that way right so um, that's the biggest foundational element of navigating through this because um, it, it just, if you don't have that baseline, you're not, you're going to struggle with communicating and managing expectations, right? And cost. Um, so it's okay to sound like a broken record sometimes. And, um, you know, you're doing the right thing by raising flags or risks proactively. Um, and hopefully everybody who's a, who's anywhere within their company feels comfortable to be able to raise those risks um, the second thing we've done, and hopefully everybody who's who's attending this session has already done it as well, but lead time, transit time, hopefully everybody's looked at that, has planned to increase it. Um, we did it at the, at the, well, at the end of last year. Um, so we had that uh, ability to leverage that and continue to reassess it because it is one of those you only know, you know, you can only predict risk so far and you need to balance how much lead time versus, you know, how much you want to buffer or not. And even within that, there's volatility. So making sure there's expectation and understanding that in a world where before you could have been 98% on time pretty consistently and it was pretty predictable, we don't get that. And by the way, yeah, we're paying more for less, right? For less predictability, less space and less movement. Um, and then redundancy and creative solutions. So I know it's, it's so easy to say, but we've had carrier meetings with all of our carriers to say, hey, you know, we'll, we'll be creative. What, what's out there that you can see? Um, we are starting to see certain carriers come in and say, hey, we've got a one-time feeder. Uh, it's only going to be on, you know, this schedule. You only have this many containers on if you want it, right? We're, we're having those conversations and it's ad hoc. It's product going to ports that might not be a standard port for us. Um, but you have to make yourself, for us at least, a shipper of choice and a shipper that stands out and trying to do it in ways that aren't just through a paycheck, right? Through, through money um, to be able to show up. I think there's other, it's it's changing ports or flexibility around ports. And I want to be specific. Like we've had to be very clear with partners to say, I know in the past we've said, we only want to load these ports or we only want to move this way. Ignore that. Like anything goes, tell me what's working. And I've heard of other partners or shippers, um, you know, importing on the East coast and backhauling to the West coast. Like there's crazy stuff that people are doing out there right now. Um, Transload options. I will say to the ocean freight side, Mike said it. Yeah. Shippers um, do not want to bring carriers do not want to bring cargo into the Midwest. So a lot of the opportunities that have popped up have been CY only moves. Um, So thinking through how do you be flexible in your supply chain and, and how do you grow in this moment to leverage control where you can. And it is a week to week battle. Um, So that's the other piece is from an ocean cost standpoint, I don't know anybody who, you know, contracted their RFP this year, got everything they wanted and hasn't, you know, faced a PSS conversation or three since standard contract period. Um, So costing is a, is a week to week battle. Um, You can certainly leverage nice checks and spot quotes and whatever else. Um, I wish you could fall on, forecasts like I've heard in other forums people saying oh if we only had great forecasts things would get more stable it that's not the world we're in right now um, right. we do have a great forecast and we still can't get everything we want because it just isn't enough um, so ocean cost planning for disruption and as a budget owner making sure you're being pragmatic and not 
optimistic about that that budget as well in the reality of of the year ahead of us that we have. So those are just a few things we've leveraged. Yeah, wow, those are awesome. Well, Jung, did any of those resonate with you? Or are you doing other mitigating um, activities to help lower costs and find creative solutions to bring product in? I mean, there are so many. Um, I mean, Mary had brought many great ideas about logistical um, front. Um, since I'm managing all the raw material suppliers and factories, um, the cost is not just the freight, but it's everything, you know, in terms of the labor in each region is going up. The owner had to provide the PPE and social distancing. That means lower productivity and, you know, output. And so, the labor and the overhead is definitely up from, you know, year to year economy growth, the normal labor rates, you know, we expect it to go up every year, but this is um, definitely higher than, you know, what we would normally experience um, because of all the measures that the factory owner had to put in place in terms of the COVID measures. Um, also, as you can see, the oil price is going up. So anything related to P PU or PVC, um, you know, I've also been noting that meat consumption has been down since COVID started and, you know, supply and demand there is also pretty mixed up. So the high prices are going up and also the supply is more scarce. So honestly, the issues are compounded and, you know, we know the cotton prices have also gone up. So if, you know, for factory that we manage, if all the raw material that needs to come into the factory to assemble the product, already has a higher cost to bring the raw material into the factory and the labor cost is up and there are, you know, COVID measures and the finished goods rate is also up. So as you can see, I mean, this is really um, exponential increases. You know, we're trying to provide value where uh, we see fit. You know, I think that instead of focusing on the um, what's not working, you know, we're really studying what's selling and focusing on what's working and, you know, what is customer responding to. And I think our goal is to try to sell more things in full price by compelling, uh, providing compelling um, product. So we can't do much about the cost, but we can do things differently about studying what customer wants so that we can make the right product. I think that's kind of what we're focusing on to mitigate the risks. I love that. I'm, glad, I'm so glad you brought that up because we have been in such a promotional and deflationary period for well over a decade for our industry where if you didn't have a 40% off um, banner in your front window of a rack room shoe or, or a DSW or wherever, the consumer might not even come across your threshold, right? And so now we're in an environment where we might be able to sell more things at full price. The expectation from the consumer is that prices are going to go up. Uh, and so there might be, uh, really, the silver lining might be a movement away, at least for a time, in a highly promotion from this highly promotional era that we've been in. And so that I'm glad you, I'm really glad you brought that up, Jung. Now, Peter, uh, you've heard what Mary and Jung have had to say about their mitigation strategies. Any of them resonate with you, or are you doing something totally di different on your end? Uh, John stole a little bit my thunder because that was the point that I also wanted to make. It's not so much really on the on the cost side that there's a big room for improvement. It's it's really how you deal with kind of your G and A expenses in the company in general, and and most importantly, and that's a good thing about the situation currently with with the. I don't want to call it the scarcity of product, but uh, the availability of product in the market. If you have the product available in your store and, and, and you can offer it to the customer, the customer is willing to pay for it. So we have we, we, we see that we are able to, to be less promotional at the moment. Our AURs went up and uh, that, that our customer is willing, uh, as long as she or he gets what he wants or she wants, that, that she is willing to pay the price. Um, so th there's no question about it. And that's the silver lining on, 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 on the current situation. Sure, yes, it has been spiked by the uh, child credits uh, that just came out. But the good news is that we are going into a back-to-school season that we think is going to be big. And, uh, and we're hopefully going to continue this through the holiday season. Um, coming, coming back to, to, to really the cost side, um, I would very much go along with, with, uh, with Mary there and her quote and, and, and level setting expectations with all of your stakeholders, especially internal in the company. 
And that was uh, one of my biggest issues in the beginning that, that uh, we, we all as merchants thrive for, for efficiencies, right? But in a situation like this, you, 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 yes, you can control the cost in a better way by getting creative, but you can really kind of uh, build efficiencies somehow in the system because you don't know where, because it's changing every day. Um, so we went out, for example, we went uh, working with brokerage, working with our partner factories, working with our uh, branded partners um, to, to accept different ports into the country, for example, or routes into the country. Um, we, um, we even kind of found different ways of, of getting the product <clears throat> out of Asia uh, to make sure that we're getting getting it out because certain certain ports of origins were, were pretty much blocked or didn't didn't get any containers. Um, so yes, you can find some creativity, but, but that creativity at least allows you to stay um, current with your product, uh, stay current in the market, and and hopefully attract the customer with that. Uh, in the end, uh, I, I I really can't talk about cost savings here except for less trouble. There's none to be had. Um, none to be had. <laughs> Mike, what are we missing? Anything that you didn't hear that you think would be important for people to know? You no, know, you know, I think um, you know, one thing that you know, we're, we're really focused on the international logistics, right? The air and the ocean markets. But one thing that's been really uh, interesting for me to watch is, you know, the, just the cost across the board, you know, pallet costs, you know, used to be $10 less a pallet than they are today. And, and then the trucking costs and the parcel costs are really elevated as well. So, you know, cost savings is not something that, you know, the, you know we, we see everything heading the other direction across the board as it relates to the supply chain, logistics, boxes, things of that nature. So um, we're just, you know, we are trying to be as efficient as possible. And, and I guess what I mean by that is just, you know, not waste too much time on things that we don't think are going to work in this challenging environment. You know, we used to spend a lot of time trying to drive down that cost and, you know, uh, you know, whether it was through negotiations and we're just not in that kind of mode these days. We're, we're just trying to you know, focus on where we can get the capacity, how we can get the capacity and how we can get it out to the customer as quick as possible. So the cost savings, nowhere, nowhere that I'm seeing at this moment. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, we'll move on to our next hot topic. That's poor congestion. Jung, is that still an issue from your perspective? Um, are I mean, you... it's a growing issue, like you mentioned. Um, it's, you know, it's getting better a little bit, but I do think that it's an ongoing issue just as the origins having an issue and there's a lot of um, movement that's in balance. So overall, I think it's something uh, we definitely pay attention to, um, but it, it looks pale compared to sort of the delays we're experiencing from the origin side. So, you know, we used to talk about the port congestion quite a bit, but now with all of the challenges of even getting the goods onto the container and the delay there is so much greater that I think compared to that, it seems like it's getting better, but I don't know if it's really getting better. So, you know, it's really both of the challenges combined is tough for all of us, you know, um, with, with, you know, supply chain lead time, um, established, especially for holiday season, holiday dates don't really change. So when you have certain dates, such as back to school, it's something definitely we pay attention to. Um, yeah, so the issue is still there. And as Mary touched on it, you know, the notion of we only ship this way or move this way, I mean, those assumptions are kind of over. And then we're bringing the goods um, creatively and staying flexible. Um, also because situation changes daily and weekly. So what might have been a good idea last week, you might find this week that, oh no, things have already changed or now everyone's jumping on this van wagon. So like now we have to do something else totally to stand out or move faster. So I do see that, you know, one person or one brand might take a risk in doing something unorthodox. And next week I would say it's packed. Everyone's doing it that way. So, you know, it's good that we're all sharing information and trying to learn from each other. Um, at the same time, it shows that there's really no good sustainable solution to this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So Mary, um, you talked about diversifying your ports of entry, trying creative things. Um, but Jung brings up a really good point we might not have congestion and it might be easing a little bit, but that's because we're something's hitting the fan 
down the supply chain even earlier, which is even more challenging. Is that the same? Is that what you're seeing from your side of things? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when you look at the ports, right, the numbers at LA Long Beach that everybody was talking about at the beginning of the year, obviously, they're not the same numbers, but carriers have also worked to manage their assets. They don't want to have equipment sitting there for weeks at a time, right? So there's a reason that, you know, sailing schedules changed and those brands that pull into Europe, you know, there are plenty of blank sailings into Europe um, and then exporting out of origin. So I I think we're just seeing this pendulum swing and some of it's controllable and some of it isn't, right? So so the NTN COVID um, challenges, I think GOC had an article last week of like, watch the tsunami come in, right? Because it's all Mm -hmm. the vessels that were able to divert to different ports um, whether any one of the other ports that all of us got creative with, with our carriers to keep cargo moving out of China, um, it still is going to come in and it's going to come in at an incongruent time. And so we're going to continue to see these pendulums switch um, kind of back and forth. And port is one piece of the supply chain that's going to have that, right? Rail is on one side of the fence. Port is a little bit more stable. Origin ports are a little less stable. We're just going to keep seeing this. And that's why I think, again, when you look at that outlook, it's it's months because it's going to continue to be this back and forth. I mean, you think about the um, one week of holiday closure at terminals could have been, you know, a couple of weeks of cleanup. And we're talking about months of, mm-hmm. of challenges and, and high volume and um, congestion points all across all of our supply chains. So, yeah, it's no longer just about one port or a couple of ports. It's, it's about the global network and the variability across it. Yeah. And that ship just seems to keep rocking back and forth. I have a few more questions. We have just a little bit more time. If you have questions in our audience, please go ahead and start submitting those so we can handle them accordingly. If not, I'll just keep asking the ones that I have. And I have just a few more. And Peter, I want to pivot to you right now. Uh, Inventory, you represent, you do have a lot of retail space. Uh, You know, Mary and and Jung's companies do as well. Um, But you, you all have a lot of retail space. Talk to me about inventory from your perspective. Um, as you all are professionals and trusted with getting, like it's your job, it literally is your job to get the shoes to to the stores themselves. How are your various inventory levels right now? How are you feeling about inventory? Um, walk us through, um, you know, what you're thinking about inventory right now, Peter. Uh, inventory was for sure for a certain period of time an issue or the un- unbeknown stuff of whether we're going to get the inventory. We, we were in the overall lucky position that we were able to, to manage inventories um, and didn't face serious issues. Uh, yes, we had some, some inventory concerns, uh, specifically in, in certain stores, not across the whole uh, group, but uh, in certain stores. And, and uh, the, the challenges came, came simply as, as in, in simply as delays from our international inbound side. Um, again, with all of the things that uh, Jung and, and uh, Mary just mentioned, but uh, for the majority from, from, our, from our branded partners uh, that, that uh, it seems during the uh, pandemic had, had uh, major issues, maybe furloughed uh, more people than, than, than they were supposed to be doing. We, we were in the lucky position of keeping our experts and, and kept our own supply chain somewhat uh, intact. But we saw a lot of issues uh, after the uh, gates uh, opened up again with this product coming from Asia that uh, uh, some of our branded partners struggled. Fortunately, not all. Thank you, Mary. Um, but we had our serious issues with a couple of brands, and and uh, I, I think that is over. But that that uh, kind of brought us to a different uh, kind of level of, of of challenges. Finally, after the volumes came in, and everybody was chasing product, the markets picked up, and and merchants went out there to to look for product. Uh, we were faced with a, with a different issue that that really caused some of the uh, shortages in, in some of the stores, which was just the product mix. We we are used to getting uh, um, pre packs. We are used to getting case packs, which we pretty much cross stock right away to our stores, or just pick out of the racks and send a full assortment to the stores. Uh, with our merchants being being. Uh, required to catch up with the market, uh, anything that was available out there in the market was pretty much sizes. Uh, so when you got out there and, and you, you chased product to make sure that you're, you're current in your, in your stores, 
you needed to chase those. And and um, our, our biggest challenge was really in the distribution centers that that we weren't built for for that amount, the sheer amount of bulk product, uh, meaning sizes, to being able to be processed uh, in in a timely manner. Uh, we got creative with our partners there, uh, spent a lot of time with them. Um, uh, and I think we are behind the situation now. We are we are we are we are good in our uh, sales. We are good in our inventory in stores now. We are not quite there, but we are we are I would say getting close. Um, but uh, it, that was the biggest challenge, uh, and that just shows how diverse the different elements or important the different elements in the supply chain are, and how fragile the whole system system is. Just not just talking about ports, congestion there, not getting containers and so on, uh, but even the way you get your product mix, how, how this triggers through the supply chain and causes issues on the other end. What I'm mainly uh, worried about is, is really kind of, and I think we mentioned that in the very beginning is the situation in the sourcing markets currently. Mm. Um, Vietnam, Indonesia, Bangladesh. I mean, you 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 have major disruptions there, and and that's a part that nobody can judge. I think uh, a big uh, athletic company came out with some news this morning that that uh, there might be major disruptions. We had actually some conversations with them as well already last week. Um, that is one thing that that uh, that I'm really concerned about. Uh, again, the extension of the um, the Delta variant uh, of the of the coronavirus, and then uh, most importantly, currently the the uh, lack of containers and ship space out there, which which seems to not uh, kind of break off. And and I think those are going to be the things that I'm really losing sleep on uh, for for the holiday season. Yeah, yeah, those one of those would cause someone to lose sleep, much less all of them combined. But at least right. good news, it sounds like Mary's killing it and getting you the product that you need. So uh, that's good to hear. <laughs> to now, some Mary, extent. You have, the, you have the inventory you need for all of your retail partners right now. Talk to me about your inventory concerns. Not just not just Peter. I mean, I think um, yeah, everybody is is working to make sure they have the right inventory. I agree with Peter's sentiment of um stable now, but it's, it's what we're looking forward to of, right. Just like we've said through all of this, we're not, we're not through it. We're still in the thick of it. We have many origin countries that don't have a vaccine around the corner and yet consumer demand still strong. Brand strength is strong. Um, so we've had the, the blessing of a strong brand right now and really fighting to make sure we are meeting all of our customers needs as much as we can and getting everything every last pair into all of our markets. And that's not just the US market, but even European markets and Asian markets that have had the kind of uh, capacity stolen from them or taken from them or both stuck in the way, whatever you wanna say year to date, um, that has also detoured capacity out of out of other regions. So uh, it's headwind. I, I, I do wanna say, right, everything Peter said is correct. Um, joking aside, I actually think it still comes to the, what can you do, right? Like, okay, yeah, there's there's all this stuff happening and it's market conditions and you can't control a lot of it. You can navigate through it. You can lead your teams and your people through it. Um, so I think those, there's two things that have continued to come back to us in terms of inventory. Um, one has been, again, I come back to people. It's all about taking care of people on the team because we do have players in the front line and all of our teams that every single week are fighting for every single container to make sure that we can move what we can move anywhere. Um, and then on the destination side, chasing things, looking for exceptions. I think the other thing is going to be partnerships. So um, again, joking aside, Peter and I have spent plenty of time on the phone trying to say, how can we make our supply chains work better for both of us? And we've done the same with some of our other key partners and, and team members, and even internally in our own retail and, and e-commerce continually. Like, how do we evolve this and say, this is the baseline, this is the normal. How do we get creative together to, to be able to get you the pairs? Because at the end of the day, my goal is to get the pairs out and to our consumers as much as possible too. So um, where we might not have had as collaborative conversations about our supply chains coming together, now it's the best thing you can do to lean out with key strategic partners and have those conversations and really challenge how do we not just have a solution that works for me and I just have a handoff point to Peter or anybody else, but how do our handoff points work better together and be more effective for both of us? Yeah, I love that. Collaboration is so key. And communication amongst both inwardly and outwardly is so key during these kinds of times. 
Uh, Jung, I want to ask you the same question about inventory. Then Mike, we'll pivot over to you. Talk about the port issue one last time before we before I ask my last question. So, Jung, how are you doing on inventory? Is it a, a huge huge concern? Are you able to get what you need and get it to the retailers that are key to your success? I think we're doing fine so far, but you know the challenges from the origin is not getting better. So, to um, all of the Mary's point is so valid, and that we're trying to communicate real time with the key stakeholders. Um, I think one thing I've learned is that you know, in in the context of this business, when we talk about the inventory, and you know, me as a head of um, sourcing and production, and talking to our um, other key stakeholders, it seems so business and not personal. However, this issue impacts everybody, all essential goods. Like if you go to, you know, certain stores, I went shopping for a toy for my son. I mean, the shelves are pretty, it's not empty, but it's definitely not well stocked in typical stores that I would see full assortment. And, you know, I was sharing with the internal key stakeholders um, and on the field, our sales force saying that, you know, during COVID, I adopted two dogs, you know, during lockdown. And, you know, it was something our kids wanted. I've been wanting um, the dog fence at my house for ever since last year. And it's been back ordered, back ordered. And basically the, the supplier or, you know, the fence guy is giving me, okay, wait another 90 days. Okay. Like wait another 30 days. And I just got them installed. I mean, I waited almost a year. So what I'm trying to say is that it's all very relatable when I mentioned the stories of, you know, have you gone shopping re- recently? You know, have you ordered furniture recently? Recently, And has it been that order? Everyone has a story in their personal life. And so I think sharing um, this kind of information, not as a business partner, but also make it real. We're all going through this as a person, you know, people, and you know, globally living in this life. Um, it's really helped me connect with um, our internal stake, uh, key stakeholders as well as, as well as external ones um, to bring us closer in a sense that, you know, we're all in this together, sort of sense of partnership to help each other instead of, where, you know, when's my inventory coming? And it's more of that kind of dialogue. So in a way, during this tough time, it kind of brought the um, collaboration um, closer. So mm-hmm. that's the silver lining. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. We are all experiencing what 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 you're experiencing in the business world. We're all experiencing personally all around us. So it, it doesn't. There's examples are are all around, no doubt. Uh, Mike, you wanted to chime in on the port issue, and I want to make sure we get your your point. And then I've got a lot, one last question. And then we got to close out because it is two fifty nine East Coast time. So yes, the only thing I wanted to comment on the port issue is that you know. On a regular basis, I'd say a, a daily, weekly basis, we're getting calls from customers. They might see an article somewhere, you know, one of the industry publications up, say, oh, the Houston port is operating very efficiently. Let's book to Houston. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think J- Jung was making the point like, yeah, but you know, there might not be capacity on the front end to get to Houston, right? So like, but we have to deal with that call. We feel that call constantly. And, uh, you know, one of the, you know, not everyone's very flexible, right? Not everyone's supply chain is flexible, but we also get questions like, okay, you know, we'll take it anywhere in the U S you know, book, book me Vietnam, anywhere in the U S wherever you can get it, I'll take it. And, you know, never did, you know, that never happened before. And, uh, you know, one of the struggles that I had just on a personal, I haven't been able to figure out the port situation. Like, you know, I really, really struggle with it because, you know, some weeks a port will be working well, right? Like let's take Oakland or San Francisco, right? We were like, okay, let's book everything to Oakland. That thing's running really good. And then two weeks later, you know, they introduce a new string into Oakland and the port is like overwhelmed. They can't move anything, you know, and the same goes, you know, I'm picking on them, but I mean, the same can go for any port in the U.S. One week, it looks good. And then the, then the next week, it's 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 in bad shape, backed up. And I don't know, it, it, I would just think we could throw more labor at it to get things moving fast. But it, it just, uh, it's, I think that's a very complex issue that I have not been able to figure out really up until this point. So... Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No doubt. This is all super complex. Um, all right. So we're up on time. So this will be really quick. So I, I won't value your time and you need to get off this call and go find more uh, capacity to ship product. Um, this is the last question for everyone. And so let's fast forward a year. And I think I know the answer to this based on our conversation as I've been listening intently. But what do you think your future self would tell your current self about what lies ahead? Uh, will things be easier a year from now? We've heard this 12 month thing. 
but are, is it one of those things in, you know, 60 to 90 days, it'll get better. And we just keep kicking the can down the road a year from now, will we have another year where it's going to continue to be challenging. So real quick, Mary, we'll start with you. What do you expect future Mary will tell current Mary about what lies ahead? I think I'm hoping that some of the risks that we're taking to um, be creative with supply chain from what we've done before versus where we're going pay off and that they might be the new normal or might be levers that we pulled in the long run. Um, Other than that, it also comes down to reiterating to my team members to focus on self-care and Mm -hmm. the human side of our entire supply chain, because it is going to be a long year and there is going to be unknowns. And a lot of people are still facing COVID every single day in their lives. So I think that's going to be the other piece is making sure a year from now, you still have the same talent that you have right now and that we're working as leaders and stewards of the brand, but also our people Mm -hmm. to manage burnout and, uh, and look back at how much teams have grown on the front line. Mm, Well said. I like that. Peter, what about you? I would say the current me towards my past me would say, why did you get in supply chain? And uh, (laughs) then the future, the uh, future me. uh, Why are you still in supply chain? (laughs) (laughs) No, Um, the future me, I hope, and that's more of a wish that that uh, it, it it will tell me thanks for motivating your team and your partners to 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 build a stronger and and more agile supply chain because we were lacking in some of those uh, points and and I hope that I get that. That's great, awesome, Jung. What what does future you say to current you? I will say that. I can do anything, you know, I can solve any issue. I think that's what I will say next year to myself. Looking back, I mean, what we're doing collectively as a team, industry, the whole supply chain network, I mean, including factory workers and owners themselves. I mean, what we're going through every day to try to find creative solutions and staying nimble. I mean, think about things that we've never ever thought to do before. Um, I think after this year, I think we will be able to tackle any issues and also do it in a way where it won't be so stressful. Like I can do it with a smile on my face. You know, I think we learned a lot about how um, resilient we are and the team is. And to Mary's point, it's so important to make sure the team stay motivated through um, this period of time. Mm -hmm. Got it. Mike, last word, my friend. I, I would love to charter more vessels and, and more aircrafts if I could. But, um, you know, I, th- I think from my standpoint, I'm hopeful. I, I remain hopeful that things are going to stabilize next contract season. I mean, I think they're going to be at elevated pricing. You know, I think the ocean carriers have gotten very settled into, okay, we can make a lot of money. This space is valuable to people. And I think for a while, was, the pricing was way too low. So I think we're going to learn a lot from this. And then hopefully coming out the back end, we're going to enter into the, you know, uh, more stable, I would say elevated from what it used to be, but much less than it is now. And th- that's, that's my hope. That's my hope. Yeah. Got it. I love it. Let's end on hope. Um, I want to I wanna thank each of you uh, for joining me for this conversation. Uh, I have so many good footwear friends and I include all four of you as, as my footwear friends and you're just good people and I'm thankful. And I know these are challenging times, but uh, I wouldn't want to be in the trenches with anyone else. So thank you for your time today and shedding some light on the things that you're, that you're working through, you're struggling with, you're, you're triumphing over. So um, we appreciate your time today. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, So moving forward, tomorrow is our last session, our live session. Andy's going to be checking in with the Port of Long Beach, Fila, and Jones and Vining, and um, one other person that is escaping my mind, but you can find it all out on uh, shoesupplychain.com. And if you need help accessing all the content. So there you had it, Andy. Um, Four professionals within our within our industry um in the casual space in the r- retail space in the f- high fashion space and then a guy who's moving product all over the place clearly there's a ton of challenges uh clearly we're building up this perseverance that continues to be a necessary quality of footwear companies in a super chaotic time and so I'm happy that that you and I made the decision to open this up to the broader footwork community so that people understand what we're facing and maybe some strategies to mitigate it. So my hope is that people got a lot out of the conversation. Yep. And folks, uh, as always, you can go to shoeandshow.com to get our full 
episode listings of, of all the great conversations we had over the last several years on supply chains and many other things. And again, on the bottom left side of our website, you can click on the voice note and leave us a note about how great a job we're doing uh, or about topics or guests you would like us to uh, to bring up on the show. Because ultimately, this is your show. This is The whole show is about helping the industry hear new ideas and best practices to to increase efficiencies and to make our income stronger. Uh, so on behalf of the whole FURA team, thank you for listening. Until next time, Shuin is out. Shuin has been brought to you by the FDRA, the footwear industry's association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion, helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. For information about FDRA, visit FDRA.org.